So, uh, basically, my lab is a, a bioinformatics lab that does two things. One is analyze next-gen sequencing data, and the other one is analyze microarray data. And kind of historically, I got my PhD in developing some of the, the core methods used in analyzing microarray data, so it's something that I've been doing for a lot longer than I want to remember, 12, 13 years now. Uh, and to some extent, microarrays are a technology that's not particularly evolving anymore. They've kind of reached a very stable, very strong point. Uh, and people often ask, why do we use microarrays? And actually, uh, within my team, we use microarrays every day. They're a quality control for next-gen sequencing studies. They're a cheap way of doing a large number of samples. They're a good rationale check. They're more useful for certain types of assays. And so in some fundamental way, they're important because they're still of major use. And they're important because they provide us the, the origin of most of the ways in which we analyze sequencing data. And so there's a lot of flow through from how we work with microarray data that has informed how we work with sequencing data. So I'm going to walk you through that today. And I think mostly I'm going to talk to you about what you should be thinking about in the context of a microarray experiment, what it actually looks like. You start off with the platform and the samples that you want to do, and then you ask, what do you need to do to actually get some useful biology out of that? And we'll sort of flow through that over the course of the day. So, okay. so we're basically going to be dividing I will talk with you for maybe an hour, two hours. And then at the end of that, we will uh, do a guided analysis of a microarray data. The first part might take a little bit longer than two hours, and we'll take a break probably around time, and then come back afterwards, do a little bit more uh, didactic material, and then move into the, the workshop. key things that I'd like to get out of this. Uh, I want there to be an understanding of the data itself, where it comes from, what are the types of microarrays, and why they have error. Why is this not a perfect measurement technology? What are the things that go wrong? That should allow you to appreciate the overall pipeline that we use to analyze the data. And then in the practical session, you'll learn how to input the data and do the basic pre-processing and statistical analysis. Let me start off with a question for you. The most common type of microarray is expression microarray. And DNA arrays used to measure something about RNA. So what are they actually measuring? What are these, these topic microarrays actually measuring? Mm -hmm. CDNA? What about CDNA? that has been reverse transcribed from, from mRNA. What about hybridization? What about hybridization? Yeah. Anybody want to add anything else? of a microarray is here. It's a multiplex technology containing thousands of spots, each of which contains oligonucleotides. The oligonucleotide length can vary quite a bit. And each of those spots contains picomoles of the, the oligonucleotide for a specific sequence. 
Uh, most classically, we use it to quantitate RNA, but it's also equally useful to do DNA, and the applications are very varied. We normally use them in a hypothesis generating mode. So the idea would be to identify genes or features that show some interesting characteristics over a set of experimental conditions. And then uh, that would allow you to take those into further follow-up studies to understand mechanistic detail. And so from a, a paper perspective, you'll normally see the microarray screen is figure one, or figure one and two, and then there'll be downstream mechanistic work. There are some really obvious and important exceptions. The most uh, key one would be biomarker analysis. So the idea would be that you run a series of microarrays on clinical specimens, and then you use those to discover some sort of a predictive marker that can tell you about patient response. Uh, and so Rob would have talked about some of that data yesterday. And uh, of course, there are pathway analyses that are inherently linked to microarray as well. Just because we use them in hypothesis generating, not obviate the necessity for experimental design. And I'll come back to this at the end. Not even design it properly up front. Because people will normally not the examples they can do, but they're biologically limited because they don't have the samples of that particular disease or class. Um, it's very challenging to do things scientifically. And we'll talk about principles and how to the power all the way through. So example is one of those features that is really critical to experimental design. So I'll give you an example of a problem that I've seen none of the from collaborators. So I'll say, I'm a tumor of this subtype to normal samples to understand what the response of liver specimens that are used for some other media. Compared to, oh, we have another biopsy from a patient that came last week, and that's been fresh frozen. And that sample preparation difference, six years sitting in the versus fresh frozen with a patient, makes immense differences in the problem. And so it's some sort of a batch difference. So you have no idea what the other samples are derived from the tumor versus the normal, or if they're a function of that fixation difference. So nothing is more important than your input samples. Similar patterns coming out. It sounds like the similar thing. Um, I know some of the different RNA components. So, these are so hands up if you've ever done an RNA structure. Okay, each of you mentioned a couple of ways in which you can do RNA Sure, all of these upfront issues are standardized. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes there are only 10 specimens of this in the world. And that's not really because it's all you have. But at least in that case, you start thinking here is a potential source of bias. Are there controls that I can include? Potentially, microarray. So imagine the same goes to the Yeah, that we can turn down. Alright, are you guys okay if I leave it there for the next five or six slides and bring it back up? So, uh, Let's talk about what it actually means. Your physical conception of an experiment is critical to doing good bioinformatics. So the simplest microarray is a one microarray. Let's get some of the terminology straight. The terminology is the microarray. Microarray is the
Everything that is not perfect. Everything. How much you need? What was that name? Tiny bit of the liquid will stick to it, and the robot will touch them down to the bottom. Perfect deposition will allow the liquid that to the bottom of the room.
started in Very common.
uh, an asymmetric survey works very well.
sorry, the quantitation software makes these mistakes. And so good array manufacturer will not only have these landing points scattered here, but will actually have some internal ones that we can't see so easily.
thousand different perspectives. You can think of all sorts of ways in which you can do this. But there's a lot of fun commercial challenges. So first of all, we have a lot of
Topology is, is one of my favorite topics because it's extremely difficult. There is probably nothing that we will talk about in micro analysis that is as hard as assessing the quality of individuals in the array. And essentially, nobody is really looking at this. And you could ask the exact same questions about a sequencing. Some are perfectly designed and are truly believable. Here are facts. I just don't take any The idea here is that each spot is made up of a series of pixels. And if you look at the distribution of those pixels, if it is a very even distribution of the spot boxes, I would say. Unsymmetrical distribution without one.
Know what part of life on your end? And why the first of any experiment will be those one and two, but then after a few we start seeing any one. What about the camp?
Uh, has anybody here used machine learning? Hands up. So everybody who's used machine learning, hands up. All right, so where did you use machine learning? Today? Today. Has anybody done it today? Nobody has used machine learning today. Okay, so anybody take an elevator today? Check your weather. Use Google. Amazon. If you like this book, you might like that book. Um, all of the Globe and Mail, the front page of the Globe and Mail uses machine learning. The front page of our biggest newspaper in Canada uses machine learning to decide from a couple of different features what article that they're going to show you. One of the features is geographic location, another one is the browser that you're using. So it's actually Tries to describe how those things fit together. By kind of grouping things together across two criteria. Imagine that we have a what they are. You can look at them in value chains two or in division one and division two. Each of them is quantitative and then group them together. Now instead of just big box, so it's big box X is a brand name of the same thing. And now up in phone, up in one and down in two. Thank you. 
this one is enriched for the gene X. So
Okay, so we're going to talk now. <coughs> so as Michelle said, uh, start getting the uh, cell files, the expression level files from the um, wiki to download, and then we'll work, walk into the uh, the practical right after this. Michelle, we go until twelve thirty. That is correct. Okay, so we'll probably need fifteen or twenty minutes uh, right now to go through the rest of the the didactic stuff. And what I want to talk about is giving you an example of how. Uh, the general pipeline gets changed or modified for a specific platform. This is the general pipeline, and it's got all the steps that we spend lots of time talking about. Essentially, every affymetrics experiment is quantified in the same way. We can tweak it a little bit when we see misquants or something, but by default, they all happen exactly the same way. One channel array, that means only a single sample is on each array, so there's no Psi 3, Psi 5, there's just a single fluorescent label. As with everything else, we basically ignore spot quality, so we have a couple of normalizations. Typically, affymetrics arrays will do a simultaneous normalization that attempts to account for both inter and intra array variability. Let's collapse that together kind of refined pipeline. It's going to look like this. The CEL files, cell files, are the output of the metrics quantitation, and they're our starting point. We do background correction, normalization. The step that's unique to affymetrics arrays, probe set annotation, we'll talk about that in a second. Then we do statistics, clustering, and integration. Well, Arrays can become outdated. Actually, arrays are kind of outdated by definition. Change definitions are present at one time, point in time. We know these are the genes available today. This is our knowledge of the human genome today. And that's what we, we base everything on. However, the reference genome will be finished. Splice variants will be discovered. Different types of uh, transcripts will be decided that we know that actually is a transcript, we know that is. Graphometrics to already come on top of that, there's this cross. You have to produce only 500 copies of a single product, and you have to produce the software and the annotation. That's a lot of money. And from their perspective, they would like to have a single product that could last a long time. And so the idea is to take advantage of the fact that there are multiple probes. And so this is an example of a single gene, and that gene is called a probe set. And here it's made up of uh, 11 separate probes. The probes are spaced out. All the cell affymetrics arrays, the probes are in the mismatch. So match exactly represents the same gene. A mismatch has a Mismatch at position 13. So 12 base pairs of exact match, a mismatch, and 12 base pairs of. The idea was that you would be able to use these mismatch probes. To identify whenever there's not quite right happening, you would see a strong central tensors that mismatch and track it away. In fact, in modern arrays, they don't make these anymore, like 2008 or 
However, uh, our metric single best selling array is the U1. Uh, so does anybody know what that stands for? It stands for Unigene. So a long time ago, uh, one of the most common ways of getting the knowledge of the transcriptome was doing what's called EST sequence, sequence tags. Random RNAs, and you can sequence them, and you do this using traditional Sanger sequence. That was a pretty expensive experiment, but you could learn something about the structure of the transcriptome in this. Way. So STs would then be assembled based on our knowledge of the genome into sort of transcript clusters. So that was Unigene. So Unigene build 133. To give a quick feel for where we are today. Um, so Unigene is still available and is sort of still getting use. Um, I don't know how widely used it is today. Um, but it's available for all sorts of species, including things that don't get a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, usage from other things. And that's one of the advantages of it. So the human Unigene build is a representation of the transcriptome. And it's at build 236. So in other words, for a product that started in 1990 and is probably going through a version every month and a half, two months, that tells you how old the definition of the transcriptome that was uh, used to define Affymetric's single best-selling array today. It's like 10 years old. And so the net effect of that is... Um, the net effect of that is that is in our knowledge of the transcriptome. So even though they have all sorts of uh, wide usage today, and they represent a body of hundreds of thousands of arrays in the public literature that represent really interesting things. For example, there are thousands of breast cancer samples that have been profiled on these arrays. Correct analysis of them. So we want to be able to account for that. Mapping. That we from what? There is a high prevalence right in the middle of the afro. The afro no longer Perhaps we find out that there's a splice variant right here that separates off this part of the gene. We can stop looking at the genes. We can identify that one of these probes cross hybridized. So there's a lot of that, of course, sounds like a lot of work. Features each of 25 base pairs who wants to go ahead and like just analyze your micro. Well, fortunately, there are public resources that allow us to do that. Incorporate that right into our pre processing. And that's so let's go back. Started off talking about here can produce technical noise. So, for example, the construction of the array, scanning of the array, the high resolution, and all these things. Example preparation. So, we're thinking about the experiment and trying to bring that to what we see. Uh, for example, example identity can create sequence effects. So, imagine that I design an array based on the human genome. Are there some samples? that array is not going to be a good representation of the human genome. So, imagine that we have a, a human genome in all of some cells in your body. It should be exactly the same. Are there any diseases where the human genome is altered? How many point mutations might there be in a typical breast cancer? Now, each of those point mutations 
not just at the protein level, but even a, non a synonymous change that doesn't affect protein level will affect the hybridization to an array. Now you've got a problem. In cancer samples, you might have something that looks like it's different simply because it's the same. And so you have to be capable of using multiple probes across a gene and able to identify those types of artifacts. Hybridization conditions. Uh, this is particularly subtle, but imagine that you have a level of ozone is very correlated to the signal intensity from a microarray. In fact, some array centers have ozone-free rooms to allow them to do it. I found this out during the first year of my PhD, where I was trying to do chip-chip experiments, and I could not get anything to work in the entire summer, so much so that I I thought I sucked, which actually I do. But it wasn't just that I sucked. Nobody could get anything to work in the summer because the ozone levels in the product are not enough to stay high. And it can't be the is entirely quenched by ozone levels. So there are substantial technical artifacts that can introduce them. Processing is an attempt to, to remove those. Sometimes we don't know what they are. And when we know what they are, we can kind of But we can also identify the Pre-processing is never a substitute for good experimental design. And I'm not going to talk to you about statistical design, but there's a few things that I want you to remember when you start doing your own experiment. Number one, try as hard as you can to balance experiments with groups. Balance can mean a whole series of different things, but experimental sciences is actually from a statistical perspective. in the groups is going to be similar. Uh, balancing also means that I would wait until you have more samples before doing anything. And imagine that you only have money to do 50 arrays this year and 50 arrays next year. Save that new sample and read the new samples next year to see if it actually looks the same or led to some sort of a change. If you ever have to do, should I do a technical replicate, take multiple RNA samples from the same tumor, or do Prefer taking multiple tumors. That tells you a little bit about what You will also find out that measuring at the same time technical and biological variability together instead of just technical. Now imagine there are only three tumors of this type in the world. Money is a limiting factor, biological replication is proper. And we can very hard about how to control for processing costs. A couple of easy examples. Um, so we're dealing with some very low quantity RNAs that are taken from the transplant, where we're dealing with biopsy samples. And for those, we took a universal RNA control. It's being run with every batch. And it also across the, across the course of the experiment to provide a basis for control so that we can take a look at how to perform 10 nanograms of RNA and 100 nanograms above and see if the differences there can help us normalize the differences in the samples. And we're not going to take our examples where we have lots and lots of RNA available and get the best quality data. So we have enough RNA. What happens if all your tumors are in tissue that's been FFP fixed for five years? Well, then you call those friends and say, please, FFP, fix these normal tissues. It's really worth it. Trust me, it's really worth it. Actually, usually influence experimental design by being true about these are the problems that we're going to face. Here are examples of people not doing it right. And surprisingly, to save money and not do all the controls that they need to. And so all you can do is ask and say, I don't know this is why, and present the consequences. And people will usually listen to you. 
I find that my best wet lab collaborators are the ones who actually listen, uh, and the ones who don't listen are the wet lab collaborators that I don't particularly want to be working with. Uh, and similarly, they will sometimes tell you, you know what, that control won't work or won't do this because of some reason that you didn't realize. Or think of. And that's really good. And then you start having that two-way conversation with the bioinformaticist and the biologist about what is going on, how do we measure things, and how do we find the source of bias. We're going to start looking at some Affymetrics data. There are two major ways of pre-processing Affymetrics in the literature. It's a multi-array protocol, and it does full pre-processing. Both of these do pre-processing all the way from background correction, normalization, and process summarization. So they're, they're completely connected. Um, so our is a little bit newer than MASS-5, and they each have sort of strengths and weaknesses. They actually make an aggregate between the two. Affymetrics started to release this software in the analysis, and their, their software package was called Microarray Analysis Suite, MAS. And version 4 of it had an algorithm that was called the Average Difference Algorithm, which it was a stupid that sounds like the average of the difference in remove sources of noise and statisticians who are very good at what they did um, decided this was a bad idea. His names in biostatistics, Raphael Irizir. Uh, we can do better. What they did is develop this method called RMA. However, Affymetrics at the same time was like, you know, we could probably do better too. Affymetrics came out with Affymetrics learn something. RMA and MASS-5 are pretty interchangeable with strengths and weaknesses, but pretty interchangeable. If we don't develop the software, probably somebody else will. And so we very much minimize the amount of software development that we do. That's probably the last substantial novel algorithm that came out of Affymetrics as a company, because the, the work of those statisticians convinced them that there's no point in it. So, RMA, and that I mean, multiple replicates will tend to be much tighter. Uh, MASS-5 will have better accuracy, and by accuracy I mean even the replicates will be more likely to represent the same shows through when you do validation. So, um, if you take a look at the full changes that you get from a MASS-5 MASS analyzed experiment, However, because it tends to be going to have, um, the fact of it is that you're going to have um, more hits, and those hits get better estimates, but you might be missing stuff. Uh, MAT5 has one other In other words, you can give me one array and I can do a MAS5 normalization. You can't quite do that with RMA. There are ways to modify it to make it work in that context, so things like frozen RMA. But nevertheless, it's, it's harder to use RMA in a certain setting. So for diagnostics, MASS-5 might be preferred. For kind of small cell line experiments, like a cell line cell then you would prefer RMA because the interface allows you to have better statistics. Coffee break.